Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar on the application of the Glasgow Admission Prediction Score, GAPS. Today's webinar will be presented by Dr. Alan Cameron, consultant physician at the Glasgow Royal Infirmary, who will describe the role that GAPS can have in improving patient flow at the front door and discuss how it can be used, um, how it can be tailored to individual sites. First, we have a few housekeeping points. This session is being recorded. All attendees are muted to avoid background noise during the recording. At the end of the presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. If you have a question, please use the raise your hand option in the panel on the right hand side of your screen, and I will unmute you to ask your question in person. However, if you do have a question during the presentation, please type it in the question section on the panel. Thank you, and I'll now hand over to you, Alan, for your presentation. Thank you very much, Lena, um, and thanks everyone for uh, joining this webinar about the uh, Glasgow Admission Prediction Score. So, as Lena says, I'm Alan Cameron. I'm a consultant physician based at Glasgow Royal Infirmary. Uh, for those of you who haven't been to Glasgow before, I can assure you it's always as beautiful and sunny as you'll see in uh, the, the picture in this title slide. Um, and the, the Royal Infirmary is where we created the GAP score, and it's been going on for about five years now. Um, so we're just going to uh, outline the presentation, and um, I'm going to have to start, I think, by talking about the, the case for admission prediction. Uh, in particular, why would we want to predict whether a patient's going to come in at the front door? What's, what's going to happen is, is what's going to happen, surely. Uh, but th there are good reasons to do it. And then we're going to talk about the GAP score itself, uh, in particular how it came about and what my thought process was behind uh, coming up with the GAP score. And we'll talk about how it compares to human judgment and also versus the AM score, which is another uh, tool that can be used to determine whether a patient is going to require ambulatory care. And uh, we'll also discuss some work that I've done showing GAP's prediction of adverse outcomes. And I suppose what a lot of you will be interested in is the role of GAPS in ambulatory emergency care and how it can help you look after ambulatory patients. So what's the case for admission prediction? Um, well, I think some of you will have, will have seen this slide or something similar in the past. Um, I think it's pretty obvious from this slide that something needs to be done. Um, we can see in this chart that we've got the monthly total a &E attendances in England uh, over the last several years. And um, this is this is just a &E major. So if you're looking back at kind of 2011, 2010, maybe average something like 1.7 million attendances um, every month. And over the last uh, several years, this has increased and it's showing no sign of slowing down. And we're now up at um, over 2 million monthly attendances at a and &E's. And of course, without a concomitant increase in resources or efficiencies, then you can predict what the outcome of that uh, is going to be. And we can see that on the, the next slide, which is basically just the, the last slides that are flipped upside down. Uh, this is actually taken from the BBC website. But this is the proportion of a &E patients who um, are seen within four hours over the last several years. And you can see that the um, the number has dropped from uh, sort of 98% right down to 84.4%. And this is a sort of mirror image of the, the, the last graph. So the increased pressure on a and &E's has caused this uh, fall in the proportion of patients who are seen within four hours. Now we could, we could argue about the four hour target and whether it actually represents good care, or whether it's just a surrogate for good care. But what I can tell you as a physician working at the front door is that the difference between uh, how it feels on the ground in a department that uh, sees 98% of patients within four hours and a department that sees 85% of patients in four hours is a massive difference. We have patients waiting in trolleys, we have patients waiting in cubicles for beds, we have patients with delayed treatments um, and we've got patients who are uh, not happy with their care, increased uh, irregular discharges and so on. So, so really a, a kind of less satisfactory service all round. There's also some evidence that uh, the longer you spend in A&E, 
the uh, higher your uh, mortality rate, the higher your um, your probability of being admitted. Um, this slide shows the results of one study that uh, was an observational study looking at outcomes of patients uh, in A&E. Now, I actually think there's a lot of uh, confounding variables in this particular study, but it's pretty clear there's no evidence that, that staying in A&E uh, for a prolonged period is, is good for you in any way. So how could predicting admission actually help this? Well, if we could identify as early as possible the patients who are going to be coming into hospital, then perhaps we could become more efficient in what we do. Um, in particular, with the advent of ambulated emergency care, we now have something that we can do with information about whether a patient's likely to come in or not. We can stream patients to ambulatory care uh, rather than waiting in a cubicle for them to be seen in A&E majors. Potentially it can also help us with bed management. We get an early heads up about whether a patient is likely to be admitted to hospital or not. Um, and that might help bed managers work out from looking at, at the a &E or assessment unit screen whether a patient is uh, likely to come into a hospital even before they're seen by a doctor. And you could even get an aggregate view of the department to determine what the likely bed pressure is going to be on a particular day. And that might give you some lee leeway if, for example, you have the option of opening extra beds uh, or enlisting extra staff. Now, it may also help with decision support. Um, what I mean by this is that a lot of uh, decisions with regard to admission and discharge are made by junior doctors. And if those junior doctors uh, know that the patient in front of them um, would statistically have a lower probability of coming in uh, or a higher probability of coming in uh, based on their similarity to previous patients, then that might help to determine whether the patient should uh, be admitted to hospital or whether they could either go to ambulatory care or be discharged. Lastly, of course, uh, predicting admission doesn't just help with streaming to ambulatory care, but you may have other options for where you can stream patients. You might be able to stream them directly to, for example, a medical assessment unit or an AMU or a downstream ward or minor injuries out of hours uh, or, or to their own GP. So there's various options for, for what you can do with information. So at what point are we going to predict admission? Well, the first clinical assessment that we make in uh, ED um, is, is at triage. So it would be ideal to make uh, some sort of prediction at the point of triage. But we know from historical studies that triage staff can't accurately predict admission, or at least not in general. Um, there are Obviously, there are cases where the triage nurse uh, could be very accurate in their prediction. If someone comes in with a, a splinter on their finger, then they're not going to be admitted. But if a patient comes in with uh, you know, raging uh, meningococcal sepsis, then they're very likely to be admitted. But the majority of patients, of course, aren't at either extreme, and they're somewhere in the middle. And uh, we know that when there's uh, some dubiety, that nurses are just not that accurate at uh, predicting admission at the point of triage. Um, so that's a bit of the background, and, and uh, we're just going to talk about the, my thought process for creating the GAP score a few years ago. And that was that at that point, there had been several tools that had been created to try to help predict admission at the point of triage. And you could roughly categorize them into uh, simple tools, um, which uh, use a few different parameters, but tended not to be very accurate. And there were more accurate tools but they tended to be quite complex, for example, using bespoke software to work out a, an admission probability. But what we lacked was a, a simple and accurate tool uh, to try to work out the probability of admission at the time of triage. And this got me thinking that, well, we collect a lot of clinical data at triage already. We collect things like the patient's observations. We've already got some electronic records for the patients about their attendance history. We know their age. We know their gender. We know what time of day they're presenting. We know how they presented. We, we know whether they were referred by another doctor, etc. And presumably some of these, at least some of these clinical parameters must be associated with an increased probability of admission. So what would happen if we simply took all of these variables that might have some sort of um, uh, correlation with uh, probability of admission and plug it into the appropriate statistical model? Then that statistical model should spit out an equation that uh, tells us which of the parameters 
are good predictors of admission and how relatively important each one is. Um, using a little bit of uh, practical knowledge, uh, we can then convert the the various weightings from the model into something that could be useful as a practical clinical score. Um, so the the way that I, I uh, went about doing this was uh, did a multi-centre retrospective cross-sectional study across North Glasgow. Uh, so it was every unscheduled secondary care attendance over a two-year period, um, almost a, a third of a million patients. And uh, using two-thirds of that uh, patient cohort, put all of their uh, triage recorded variables into a mixed effects multiple logistic regression model and then used the equation that, that this model generated to create a clinical score which was then tested on the remaining one third of patients from the cohort. Uh, so just to break that down into its component numbers, um, we, we ended up with 322,000 attendances uh, in 191,000 uh, individual patients and uh, we had a, an admission rate of around about 40% which is, is pretty standard as you'll see throughout the rest of the presentation. So 215,000 which is two-thirds of the attendances were used to uh, create the score and then I used the remaining patients as, as a validation group to find out whether the score actually worked. And this is the, the score that effectively the, the model uh, generated for us. <clears throat> uh, and this, so this is the Glasgow admission prediction score itself, this is GAPS. And you'll see that it's made of six different uh, variables, predictor variables. Um, and just to go through these, we, we have age. And um, it's fairly straightforward. You get one point per decade that you've passed. So this is rounded down. So for example, if uh, the patient is 28, they get two points. If they're 32, they get three points. If they're 99, they get nine points. Uh, now, new score forms part of uh, GAPS itself. And uh, rather than trying to reinvent the wheel and putting all the different uh, blood pressure, heart rate, SATs, and so on into the GAPS score separately, we calculated a new score and uh, that has approximately equal weighting with, with age in the final model. So you get one point uh, per new score. So you just add that on to the points that you got for the patient's age. Uh, triage category is strongly predictive of admission. So when I'm talking about triage category, I'm talking about the Manchester triaging scale. And uh, a triage category of three will get you five points, two will get you 10 points, and one will get you 20 points. If you have a triage category of four or five, then you don't get any additional points added on. We also found that referral by GP was a strong predictor of admission and uh, is weighted at 10 points, so that gets added on to everything else. If you arrive by ambulance, you're more likely to come in and you get five points. And if you've been admitted to hospital within the previous year, you also get five points for that. So you sum up these um, all of these points for these different variables and that gives you a total score and usually the score will be somewhere between one and uh, somewhere in the mid 40s would be sort of that the uh, highest scores that we would see so going back to the original study we uh, had 107,000 patients who were in our validation group so what we did was apply this score to them so each of the 107,000 patients got a GAP score and we looked to see what happened uh, to the patients. So for example, um, there were uh, several thousand patients who scored uh, a 17 from the val validation group. And um, when we look, we see that just over 50% of them were admitted. The red point, uh, the red points on the graph represent the proportion that were admitted and the black lines are the 95% error bars. Uh, so you can see that the Patients who had a, a score of one, uh, almost none of them come into hospital. And conversely, if the score was up at the uh, sort of 40 mark, then they were almost certain to come into hospital. And there's a very nice uh, continuous gradation in between all of the different uh, points on, on the chart. Another way of showing how discriminating gaps is, is to pl plot a receiver operating characteristic curve 
And for those of you who are not familiar with it, this is really just a way of uh, showing the uh, the true positive rate uh, versus the false positive rate of a diagnostic test. Um, the diagonal line would be a test that is completely non-discriminating, so something that's completely random, and the area under that would be 0 0.5. A perfect test would be uh, a sort of square shape and would have an area under the curve of uh, 1. So GAPS, it turns out, has an area under the curve of 0 0.877 for predicting admission, and that puts it in the range of uh, a, a very good diagnostic test. But why does it work? What's it actually telling us? Well, we often think of illness um, as being a, a single dimensional variable that ranges from someone who's very healthy to someone who's uh, moribund or who's dead. But actually, when you think about it, that, that can't be right. There's different ways of being unwell um, that require hospital admission. Um, and an example might be uh, someone who's young, fit and, and healthy who becomes acutely unwell, say, with uh, again with raging meningococcal sepsis will have an acute physiological upset and that will mandate their admission into hospital. But it's not the case that everyone who comes into hospital is acutely unwell in that sense. There are people with chronic comorbidities um, who have to come into hospital with uh, with a different set of needs other than an acute physiological upset. So, you know, if you think of an example, a patient with COPD and type 2 diabetes and ischemic heart disease might pick up a relatively minor chest infection, but it might make them hypoxic, and that might cause a bit of myocardial ischemia. Meanwhile, their sugars have become uncontrolled because they're on some steroids for their exacerbation of COPD, and they've therefore got uh, three or four different problems that all need to be uh, addressed, and it's really too much to be addressed in the community, they therefore come into hospital. Another uh, group uh, that, that we may see are people who are physically dependent or, or psychologically dependent on uh, external help for the activities of daily living. And this might be people with pre-existing um, uh, pre illnesses, pre-existing disabilities, um, or, or it may simply be people who have a lower threshold for uh, seeking medical help, a low threshold for attending their GP or for attending hospital. But these things are all independent factors they're all, if you like, in, uh, orthogonal dimensions uh, of of illness that, that all have an additive effect on a patient's need for admission. So if you combine physical dependence and uh, chronic comorbidity with an acute physiological upset, you're far more likely to come into hospital than someone who only has one of these uh, features. Now, unfortunately, we can't measure all of these things quickly at triage. We can't measure uh, the degree of someone's chronic comorbidity, physical dependence, and acute physiological upset uh, with the time we've got available in triage. But um, we do have a lot of other data, and uh, we've got the parameters within GAPS. And these parameters actually all act as, as surrogates when you think about it. Um, news score is a fairly good surrogate for acute physiological upset. Um, whether someone's been in hospital in the last year, whether they've been referred by their GP, um, is a good measure of chronic comorbidity. And I think arriving by ambulance um, and age are, are reasonable surrogates for uh, physical dependence. And there's a bit of overlap between all of these things, but what they do is they add up to give us an overall picture of the sort of multi-dimensional components of a patient's ill health and therefore their need for an acute hospital admission. Uh, so one of the criticisms that I came across quite early on is, oh, do we really need another clinical score? There's tons of clinical scores. There's apps for clinical scores. Whatever happened to good old-fashioned clinical judgment? Um, and my answer to this is that, well, clinical judgment, of course, still has a, a huge role to play um, in almost everything that we do day to day. But that's not to say that it can't be aided or maybe even superseded by a clinical score. And if the clinical score turns out to be better than human judgment, then for the good of patients, we should use it. Uh, so to me, this is an empirical question that we should answer. It's not just something that we should uh, go on a tirade about. Um, so we set out to do uh, just that at, uh, here at Glasgow Royal, and uh, we compared the accuracy of admission predictions from triage nurses to the admission predictions made by the GAP score. And this was a prospective study of 
1,830 ED attendances and again about a 40% admission rate. And what we did was we asked the triage staff at the, the time when the, they were triaging the patient to estimate uh, how likely it was that this patient was going to come into hospital. The way that we did this was with what you call a visual analogue score. Um, and a very low tech, but it's a, a 10 millimetre line on paper. And uh, if you can think about it, the, the left edge of the line represented uh, a patient who was definitely going to be discharged. And the right edge of the line represented a patient who was definitely going to be admitted. The nurses were simply asked to measure a, uh, to put an X somewhere on the line to represent how likely it was that they felt the patient was going to come in. Now, what we found was that nurses were, um, when they were confident, so when they felt that uh, the patient was very likely to come in or very unlikely to come in, then their instincts were normally right there, and in fact, they were they had a very good accurate, uh, uh, very good accuracy rate in those bottom and top five percent of cases, um, where they actually got ninety two point four percent of their um, their predictions correct. Where they fell down was in the majority of cases, which uh, in which it was much less clear whether the patient was likely to come in. Uh, so if they weren't in the top or bottom 5%, then uh, the nurses were only 68% uh, accurate. And really, uh, that's probably not accurate enough uh, to make useful predictions about what's going to be happening to a patient on an individual basis. Um, so what we found is that when the nurses were less confident, uh, GAPS was significantly more accurate and it was better calibrated. What I mean by better calibrated is... Um, so of these 1,830 ED attendances, GAPS predicted that there were, I think, 767 of them would be admitted, whereas there were 766 that were admitted. So GAPS got the number just about right, even though it had some false positives and false negatives. They they cancelled out nicely, but that wasn't the case with uh, wasn't the case with nursing judgment. And you can see again the comparison here between the GAPS score and uh, the visual analog score which is the, the nurse's predictions, and there's a clear difference between uh, how accurate GAPS is. It's, uh, it's above and to the left of the visual analogue score, and therefore it's a more discriminating score than nurse's judgment. So another criticism that, that we came across is, um, okay, you know, this predicts admissions, but, um, but so what? What are you going to do with that information? Um, how, how can we actually use it to facilitate ambulatory care? Uh, we've already got a score for that. We've got the we've got the AMS score. And again, I think that this is a valid criticism. You need something to do with the information. Um, if if uh, gaps predicts admission, then it must also predict discharge, and therefore could be used to identify patients who are likely to be discharged. And this is what the AMS score already does. Some of you may not be familiar with the AMS score, um, but it was developed a few years ago in a sort of rural setting in Wales, and it takes a bunch of clinical parameters that are uh, available at an early point in assessment to allow you to determine whether a, a patient would be suitable for ambulatory care. Um, so in some ways it does the, the converse of what, of what GAPS does. Um, now, the question then comes, well, if we're trying to use GAPS to determine who could go to ambulatory care, why not just use the AMS score? And again, I think this is an empirical question. We have to compare the two head to head uh, and see which one performs better. So again, th th this was something that we did. Um, on this occasion, rather than um, limiting ourselves to the somewhat uh, unusual demographic of Glasgow, uh, we decided to collaborate with another site in the UK. And uh, the site was uh, in Sheffield by a, an emergency medicine team led by uh, Sue Mason and uh, what we did between the two sites was we um, collected data on consecutive patient, patients presenting for ED triage and we worked in shifts to cover uh, all 160 hours of the week to try to remove uh, confounding factors. As you know yourself, the patients that come on a Monday afternoon are very different from the patients that come at, at uh, 3 o'clock on a Friday morning, certainly in Glasgow they are. Um, and for each patient who attended triage, we interviewed them to calculate their GAPS score and their AMS score. Uh, 
And then we followed these patients up to 30 days and looked at uh, whether the patient was admitted to hospital or whether they were uh, discharged from A&E without being admitted to hospital. And it was just a, a straight comparison of, again, of the receiving operator characteristic curve uh, of GAPS versus uh, AMPS. So we had nearly 1,500 uh, patients who attended during our study period um, and about uh, 1,400 after the irregular discharges were removed. And again, about 40% were admitted. Now, what we found was that the area under the curve for GAPS was 0 0.828. Now, you might notice that that's a lower area under the curve than it was in the initial validation study of GAPS. But the reason for that is that uh, we were only looking at patients presenting to a &E majors for triage. In the original uh, GAPS study, uh, we had included patients who were taken directly to RESUS and taken directly to minors. So those two streams were removed. Uh, in some ways, these are easy predictions. Anyone who goes directly to uh, RESUS is likely to be admitted. Anyone who goes to minors is very likely to be discharged. And we were therefore left with a more predictively difficult group um, to compare gaps with AMS uh, within the AD majors only setting. But in any case, we, we found that the area under the curve for gaps was significantly higher than for AMS. Um, with a, a net classification improvement of 6%, uh, which means that 6% more patients were uh, correctly uh, categorised as requiring admission or discharge if you used GAPS than if you uh, used AMS. And again, you can just see this in a, a graphical form here, where uh, the curve for GAPS uh, has a larger area than the curve for AMS. Now, after this initial work was published, uh, we, we came across further criticism, which was that surely this uh, just tells you whether someone will be admi admitted. It doesn't tell you whether they should be admitted. And again, I think that's a valid criticism. Um, it may be the case that we are admitting a lot of patients that don't need to be admitted. And all GAPS does is it sort of repli replicates that historically. Uh, so it may actually be getting it wrong in the same way that human beings have been getting it wrong. Um, uh, another way to phrase the same criticism is GAPS is not outcome-based. So it doesn't actually, uh, we don't have any evidence on what happens uh, to people with different uh, GAPS scores. So again, we, we set about answering this uh, particular criticism in that we followed up those same uh, 1,400 patients to six months. And we split them into three equal groups based on their GAP score. And uh, we did a um, uh, time to event analysis, uh, so a survival analysis using all cause mortality, and then an, an analysis of a uh, hospital readmission, and uh, an analysis of the hospital length of stay on those uh, 563 patients who were actually admitted to hospital. So again, this is split between two sites, Glasgow and, and Sheffield, but the, the patient groups were mixed together. So this first graph is what you call a, a Kaplan-Meier graph, um, and I'll just talk you through it. Um, we start off at, at zero days, and uh, we can see that 100% of uh, the patients are, are alive at the start of the study. As we go through from zero days out to six months, then uh, some patients may die in each of the groups. And if that happens, then the proportion of patients who are still alive at that particular time will fall. And this allows us to compare the low quantile, middle quantile, and high quantile uh, of GAP scores. And there's a few things to point out about this chart. So you'll notice in particular that people with a low GAP score uh, were almost all alive at six months. Um, and in fact, there were, there were no deaths at all in the first 30 days out of the 498 patients with a low GAPS. The group with the, the middle GAPS score, um, again, had a very low early mortality rate, although as you get out to six months, um, it maybe dropped to that about 5% of them were dead um, after six months. But the group with the, the high GAPS score, you can see that their mortality um, is much higher than either of the other two groups, and that the number of patients who were alive, even at 30 days, um, was already down to, to uh, under 
and that by the time you get to six months, we're down almost to 85% uh, uh, survival at six months. So a huge difference um, depending on purely these uh, factors that are present at the time of their initial triage as to whether they will survive out to six months. Now here's a, a similar graph, but this time we're uh, looking at the proportion of patients who were readmitted to hospital after their, their discharge, either from ED or from their initial index presentation hospital admission. And what we can see with this, again, is that uh, there's a huge separation between people with low gaps, middle gaps, and high gaps, and that the uh, patients with low gap scores uh, after 30 days, maybe 5% of them then came back and required hospital admission with uh, a, a sort of middle gap score, then it was up maybe 13, 14%, but it was nearly a quarter of the patients with a high gap score would return and require admission within six months. The black lines that you can see here are, are just what you call censorship marks, so that um, patients who died have to be uh, uh, taken out of the, uh, the rest of the analysis. Um, you can see there's a lot more black ticks in the, the, on the red line than there are on the blue line. That's just because there were more deaths in the high gaps group. So lastly, we looked again at uh, the hospital length of stay. And uh, this time, we were only looking at the patients who were admitted to hospital at the time of their uh, index presentation. So of course, at the start, uh, everybody who's in this part of the study uh, is still in hospital. And by the time you get out to uh, a couple of weeks after admission, almost everyone has been discharged by then. But it's interesting to look at the different rates of discharge in the different groups. And what you see is that the patients with low GAP scores, um, they are discharged much more early than, the, or much earlier than the patients with uh, middle GAP scores and high GAP scores. And if we look at the, the time it takes to fall to 50% discharge rate, then it's only about one day for the uh, low GAPS group, about two days for the mid middle GAPS group, and close to five days for the high GAPS group. Now, this also means that the patients who were admitted with a low GAPS score, so we already know that there were uh, a much smaller proportion of them with a low GAPS score, but uh, and that they were more likely to be discharged, but of the ones who were admitted, uh, they were much more likely to be discharged in a, a short time frame. And of course, there's the argument that if they're discharged within 24 hours, did they need to come into hospital in the first place? There are some cases when the, the answer is yes. Uh, for example, if someone has uh, you know, a drug overdose and, and requires observation for, for a few hours, they may well need to come into hospital for a few hours. Um, but undoubtedly, there would, there would be some people in that group who perhaps could have been uh, managed in an ambulatory fashion rather than being uh, admitted. So one other criticism you might want to levy is that, uh, well, look, this is this is all very well. You can uh, predict whether someone's going to come into hospital. You can predict how long they're going to stay in hospital. Um, and uh, it, you might be more accurate than, than humans. But there's still got to be something that you can actually do with the information. Otherwise, this is a pointless exercise. Um, and my response to that particular criticism is, yes, <laughs> that's a fair point. Um, there does have to be something that you can do with the information. Um, uh, there's, a, there's an old saying, Hebb's Law, which is, if something's not worth doing, it's not worth doing well. Uh, and I think that applies to the GAP score as well. If you work in a, um, a small hospital and uh, you, you can either discharge someone or admit them to a medical ward and you have no other options about what you can do with them, it really makes very little difference predicting what their outcome is going to be. So you actually have to have an option about what you can do with a patient. And I think that's that's where um, the GAP score fits very nicely in, um, in thinking about ambulatory emergency care. So we've had a, an ambulatory emergency care unit at Glasgow Royal Infirmary for about four years now. And um, we, went, whilst we were setting up, we did get some advice from the ambulatory emergency care network. Um, and it was very useful looking through the, the directory of various conditions and how they can be managed in an ambulatory fashion. What we found in practice was uh, that although 
there were several conditions that we could manage on a, a per condition basis. Uh, unfortunately, there were a lot of patients who didn't meet any of the, the criteria. After all, patients tend not to present with a diagnosis. They tend to present with a group of symptoms. And the symptoms don't always marry up very nicely with the diagnosis. So, for example, if someone presents with headache and chest pain, um, they wouldn't fit nicely into any of the sort of single ambulatory care uh, condition-based pathways. However, from doing their GAP score, we know that on a sort of multidimensional measure of illness, they score quite lowly and uh, would be suitable for uh, ambulatory management or outpatient management. Um, so what we did was we, we switched to using GAPs rather than thinking about individual conditions. So we were a sort of more holistic uh, approach to uh, getting people through to ambulatory care. How sick is this patient overall? What's the overall likelihood of this patient coming to hospital? And we use a very, we use a very simple criteria, which, or criterion, which is that if the GAP score is less than 25, then the patient goes to ambulatory care, and otherwise they remain in our assessment unit proper in a cubicle uh, with a bed uh, to be assessed, with uh, with the majority of them going on to be admitted. The ones that go to ambulatory care, we've got a, a, um, a fairly good hit rate of about 90%, which is pretty standard, I think, for uh, ambulatory units. Um, and we've also got an excellent safety record. And we can get about 30% of our uh, GP referred medical attendances to our ambulatory unit. Um, so it allows our ambulatory care to be patient-based rather than condition-based. And what we've found is that this has really uh, sort of widened the net of, of the ambulatory patients that we can capture. You know, uh, try as you might, you will not have uh, pathways for each and every presentation uh, for for uh, potential ambulatory patients that, that come to your front door. Um, you know, there's never going to be a pathway for a patient who complains at the top of their heads terribly itchy every time they go to the bathroom. Um, and, you know, I'm sure you've all seen some, some weird and wonderful presentations that don't fit neatly into any of the pre-existing categories. So on this basis, GAPS has now been taken up by several uh, UK sites. Um, and the feedback has largely been positive, that, um, uh, in particular from the triage nurses. Uh, it really gives them some confidence to stream the correct patient group to ambulatory care, even if they don't fit nicely into any of the uh, pre-existing pathways. Um, and being able to consolidate uh, your ambulatory resources to, uh, to have all of these patients in a single cohort, it, it makes your default position to discharge people and manage them in a, an ambulatory fashion rather than the default being to admit as it, as it normally is a, in a, an assessment unit proper. So I'll just start to uh, conclude by saying that you know we have derived a simple but accurate way to assess the probability of admission at triage that uh, predicts death, reattendance and readmission within 28 days. also tells us about uh, hospital length of stay. It usually outperforms experienced triage staff, although there are exceptions, and it's uh, you know it's the, the caveat is that um, it should always be used in conjunction with uh, clinical experience. Um, we know that it outperforms the current uh, methods, or one of the current methods recommended by the RCP toolkit uh, for streaming to ambulatory care. Um, something that I haven't really touched on in this talk, but is uh, useful to think about, is it can be used to control for patient factors when looking at admission rates from your own unit. Uh, what I mean by that is that if you notice one month that your uh, admission rate is 40%, and then the next month you find that your admission rate is 50%, you need to ask yourself, are we doing something wrong or have our patients changed? Because GAPS is a, effectively a sort of multi-dimensional measure of a hospitaliness, for want of a better word, then if you see that the GAPS score has on average increased, then you say, well, you know, the patient demographic for some reason has it has changed over the last month, and that's why we have an increased admission rate. Or if the gaps have stayed say, the same, then it may give you um, the impression that there was something that you were doing differently in your department or within your hospital that had increased the admission rate. Um, so we do have uh, still have some further challenges uh, with regards to using gaps. I, I've talked about it mainly in, in terms of allowing you to stream patients more effectively to ambulatory care. 
Um, but of course, because it is a multidimensional measure of, of sickness, um, there may be better ways to use uh, GAPS that I haven't thought of. So, you know, how could we better use the information that GAPS gives us uh, in real time? Um, we've not yet seen any practical um, use of GAPS for uh, service planning, so for things like uh, auditing uh, whether an improvement in the, the service actually causes a genuine decrease in admission rate using GAPS to control for uh, patient variability. Um, I've, I'm not aware of anywhere that uses gaps to um, to plan for uh, bed numbers or anything like that at the moment, um, but that's another potential uh, avenue to explore uh, in future research. And of course, um, you know, I'm a bit of an evangelist for gaps, having, um, well, having created it here, but also uh, having seen it in action, and we're continuing to use it in Glasgow Royal Infirmary, and it's, it continues to be very helpful um, for our assessment unit. Um, and I'm uh, keen to see it uh, disseminated and implemented uh, elsewhere. Now, I am aware that this has been uh, a fairly uh, information-heavy talk, um, so if any of you are wanting to uh, look through some of these figures in a bit more detail uh, with a bit more time. Um, now you can either review the uh, recording that's been made of this presentation or uh, you can see the uh, original papers and the slides uh, at a sort of low budget <laughs> website, frontdoormedicine.com, um, and everything's on that. So I'm, I'm going to wrap up there. Um, I'm not sure whether there'll be many questions, but I thought we should uh, leave plenty of time just in case there are. So I'll hand back over to Lena. Uh, thank you very much, Alan. Um, as I mentioned earlier, if you'd like uh, to ask a question, please raise um, the raise your hand option on the panel on the right hand side of your screen, and I will unmute you to ask your question in person. I'll just give it another minute. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. Of course, if you do have a question um, later on, please email us on aec at nhselect.org.uk. That is aec at nhselect.org.uk. Uh, and I'll be sure to forward it to Alan. Um, okay, well, there doesn't seem to be any questions, um, so that brings us to the end of this session. Um, um, thank you for taking your time to provide us with this presentation, uh, Dr. Cameron. It's been much appreciated. Okay, thank you very much, Leah. Thank you very much, everybody. Okay. Bye.